full-time ministry at uh, Alpha Baptist Church in Morristown, Tennessee. And Don Chastain, my pastor, said, I want to take you with me to the North Carolina, uh, to the uh, Tennessee State uh, Pastors Conference and Convention. So we go. And while we were there, this singer got up and sang this song like I've never heard it before. And he sang it completely a cappella, no music, and brought the place down. It was amazing. And I have never forgotten the power and intensity that he sang. And I don't intend to copy that. But I want you to hear how that last verse 
should be sung by the saints. So just listen. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, sometimes it makes me shout Glory, 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 glory. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Amen. Next Sunday, we will celebrate that Jesus rose up from the grave. It's going to be an exciting time. I hope you'll plan to be with us. This Thursday night, we'll be celebrating our annual Maundy Thursday service out in the gym around tables. And we'll be walking through the events of Holy Week, what happened each day of Holy Week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And we'll conclude with the celebration of the Lord's Supper there around the tables as reenacting what the disciples went through with Jesus on that Maundy Thursday back during the original Holy Week. I really hope you'll plan to be with us on Thursday at 6.30. This afternoon, right here in this sanctuary, at 3 o'clock, right? 3 o'clock? Right. At 3 o'clock, you'll see the wonder of the cross choir's been working really hard on that to present a musical presentation of the wonder of Easter, the message of the resurrection of Christ. This is a celebration of the single most important event in all of human history. I hope it's special and meaningful to you because you're a believer and a follower of Christ. I hope you'll participate in these events here at your church and also I hope individually in your own life, your own home, your own family setting, you have an opportunity to participate in celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I don't know if I mentioned this, but it is the single most important event in all of human history. Amen. Next Sunday, we'll also be celebrating baptism, hopefully in each service, but uh, that demonstration of new life that comes. It's not just that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's that when we put our faith and our trust in him, we now have that assurance that just as he was raised from the dead, we will be raised from the dead. Amen. Aren't you glad to be here today? Amen. In the scripture it says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I'm glad when they said to me, let's go to church. A little chilly outside today, but that's all right, isn't it? We've gathered together to go to church. If you happen to be worshiping with us for the first time here in person or online, we want to extend our warm welcome, and we're so glad that you're here. Always glad to make new friends. Uh, we'd invite you, if you're here for the first time, on the way out the door, if you didn't do so coming in, there's a, there's a guest services table right out there in the lobby. Just stop by and be introduced to one of our church members, get some information about our church, and uh, ask any questions that you'd like to. We'd be happy to give you those answers and encourage you any way that we can. The door is always open. There's always room for one more. And we would look forward to that as well. Would you pray with me? Randy, come and pray for us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Randy Carden and part of the deacon team on call this week. In your bulletin is names and numbers of all on our team. And uh, we're more than glad to speak with you, pray with you, or whatever we can do for you. Uh, to take into consideration, I just pick up the phone and call us, and we're more than happy to do that. Yes, uh, let's pray, please. Our Father, we chart in heaven, you, you've just been so good to us that sometimes we fail to thank you properly. And we forget that when the hard times hit, 
There's been more good times and there's more good times to come, Lord, because soon we shall be with our loved ones in heaven and, and with you to permanently celebrate what you did on Calvary. Help us to help us to always be mindful that not everyone has made that decision in their life. And Lord, this morning we we as a group we we lift our hearts and our, our minds to our pastor who's well prepared to preach. God touch him and help him to deliver a message that will touch hearts this morning. And we we humbly thank you and we ask all things in uh, the name of Jesus. Amen.
Choir and thank you, Al. Thank you, Handbell Choir. Thank you, Sound Booth. The wonder of the cross this afternoon. I look forward to being here. I hope you will as well. It's not too late, Al, to go home and call your friends and neighbors and invite them to come, is it? So uh, feel, please feel free to do that. I want to ask you to mark your calendars. Mark your calendars. Uh, the farther in advance you know something, the better. Mark your calendars for August. This August, the 3rd through the 10th, August 3 through 10, 2024, and that's going to be part of uh, Baptist, our Baptist State Convention across the state of North Carolina. We'll be having a promotion, a program, an outreach, call it what you will, called Serve NC. We will be involved along with hundreds of other churches 
in reaching our local community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am very thrilled and excited about it, looking forward to it. And we do this in order to connect to our neighbors. We want to connect to the neighbors in and around the northern Durham community. Uh, We're even willing to reach up into Person County, over into Granville County, over into Orange County, uh, Wake County. I don't know about Wake County, but we'll, uh, you know, anywhere... uh, Anywhere people are, we want to invite people to come. We're going to be involved in prayer walking, Bible clubs, Bible studies. Uh, We'll be looking at some community service projects. And uh, these are going to be organized through our Connect groups. So if you are in a Connect group, you can know that in the days to come, you'll be hearing more about uh, how your Connect group can be engaged in Serve NC. If you're not in a Connect group, we don't want you to be left out. Start now. Find a Connect group now. And uh, there are some there are a listing of connect groups out in Connection Central. There's pictures of all the leaders, so you can find the one you like the best. And uh, uh, we're going to have a great time through our connect groups. It's going to be a really big deal. And it's not going to be just that one week. There will be things we're doing in advance to prepare, things we'll be doing afterwards to follow up. Uh, I am very excited about the possibilities of Serve NC. And you might say, well, Pastor Mark, Why? Why why are you so excited about this? Why are we going to go to all this trouble to be involved in something called Serve NC along with other churches? And the why is because we are called to connect to God, one another, and our neighbors. We're called by God to connect to our neighbors. Whether we like it or not, we're supposed to like our neighbors. Whether we like it or not, we're supposed to reach out to our neighbors. Everybody who's anywhere is a, is, a, is, a, is a target for us to share the wonderful good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew 13, which is where we're looking today, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 13 uh, reminds us of our need and our opportunity and our responsibility to connect to our neighbors for Christ. And as we talk about what we're about at Ridgecrest Baptist Church, we're here to connect to, our, to, to connect to God, to one another, and our neighbors And connecting to our neighbors, we have two statements that we make. One is that we pray boldly. We pray boldly. That's what we're called to do. And we go intentionally. Uh, We go intentionally. The days are past when we can say, well, they know where we are if they want to come. That's not how the Bible, the Bible doesn't say y'all come. The Bible says us go. So uh, that's part of what we're looking to do uh, based on what the scripture tells us, exemplified in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable about dirt, of all things. Jesus tells a parable about dirt or soil, and he compares different types of soil to the condition of the human heart. And he does that to demonstrate who we are and the fact that we need Jesus. This parable is found in each of the first three gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record this story that Jesus told a parable. The word parable, if you don't know, literally means to cast alongside. To cast alongside. It's the favorite teaching method of Jesus. It, it, it says that you know, we have recorded many parables, and uh, I'm looking forward to working through those at some point here in our worship services. But he spoke in parables. Many are recorded in Scripture. And it says in Scripture, he said many other parables that aren't recorded. To, to be a parable means to come alongside. It's a comparison of one thing to another in order to make a larger point easier to understand. That's what Jesus did. He's all about helping people understand simply the great spiritual truths that God entrusts to us. And Jesus lets us know that the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Our faith is not an outward faith. Our faith is an inward faith that reflects and flows out outwardly. Uh, and I would say this, I put this in your listening guide there in your bulletin. I put it at the top and the bottom, it's that important. The statement that the condition of your heart determines your eternal destiny. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? The condition of your heart, make it personal, your heart, the condition of your heart determines the, your eternal destiny. Destiny. That's why we want to connect to God. That's why we want to connect to one another. That's why we want to connect to our neighbors. That's why we want to engage and participate in Serve NC in August. Because eternity hangs in the balance. Now You might get upset with me for saying this, but what we do on Sunday morning and what we do with Serve NC, what we do as part of Ridgecrest Baptist Church, it's more important even than the NCAA tournament. You know that, right? 
It's more important. Jesus said in Matthew 13 in verse number 15, quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament, Jesus said, for this people's heart has become callous. You remember what I said a minute ago? The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. The condition of your heart determines your destiny. Jesus said, this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. You see, the problem is, in the day of Jesus, he was speaking to people that had a hard heart, a calloused heart. And he was reflecting on, on the words of Isaiah from hundreds of years earlier when, I was, when God spoke through Isaiah to say, the people in that generation had a hard heart. The people in the days of Jesus had a hard heart. Guess what? All throughout history, the biggest problem in people with their heart is they have a hard heart. And Jesus was speaking to people that had a hard heart. That's the problem. Because the heart is hard and shallow and worldly, the people then, just like people now, are missing out on God. We don't want anyone to miss out on God. The solution to the problem of a hard heart is to develop a soft heart. I don't know that any of us can make our own hearts soft. I think it's something that only God can do. But when a heart is softened, as it says in the words of Jesus and Isaiah, then people can see and hear and understand and turn and be saved, be healed. So the problem is real. The solution, as recorded in the Scripture, still works today. The passage of Scripture I want us to look at, starting in verse number 3, gives four descriptions of a human heart. Not four descriptions of the same heart, but four descriptions of four different kinds of hearts as it relates to God. Many of you may know this story already. You may have studied these parables and understand. And hopefully this can be a reminder. If you've never heard it before, then you're, you're in, in great company because others haven't as well. And it's a great, easy story to understand. Jesus begins by saying in verse 3, A sower went out to sow. A farmer went out to plant seeds, basically. So let's look at, at what's, what's happening here. At the very beginning, he mentions a sower. Who is a sower? A sower is anyone who goes out and spreads seeds. Anybody that goes out, if you've ever been out in your yard or a field or somewhere, you've thrown some seeds out, you are a sower. And so a sower is simply somebody who shares the gospel of Jesus. That's how it relates to this story. A sower spreads seeds, and the seed here is the gospel of Jesus. So the sower is anyone who spreads seeds. It might be a pastor on a Sunday morning in a, on a podium in front of a group of people. It might be a connect group leader, Sunday school leader, in a, in a classroom with, surrounded by a group of people that could be, I think our smallest groups here at Ridgecrest have three or four people. Our largest groups have 50 or 60 people in them, different sizes or groups. But it might be a connect group leader. It might be an Awana leader on a Wednesday night. An Awana leader on a Wednesday night helping boys and girls memorize scripture, telling stories, leading them in games and crafts and all that fun stuff. It might be uh, somebody dealing with our students on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning up in the loft in the gym. It might be somebody singing a song. That's sowing seeds, just singing a song. Playing the handbells as a way of, of sowing the seeds of the gospel. Passing out a bulletin. It might be two friends having a conversation. A sower is anyone who shares and lives out the message of the gospel of Christ. Look at the seed. The seed here is the word of God. It is the gospel message that Jesus Christ is the son of God who came into the world, lived a sinless life, died a vicarious death, which means he died in the place of sinners of whom we all are. So Jesus died in our place on the cross was buried and raised on the third day. And here's the good news. Anyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's, an amen. That's my amen line right there. Will not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 4.12. It says the word of God is living and active, living and powerful. The word of God makes a difference. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel message, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And that word everyone means every single one. Nobody's left out of the opportunity to know Jesus Christ and trust him and see the life-changing power of the message of the gospel applied to their life. 
So that is the seed. Romans 10, 17 reminds us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And here in our story in Matthew chapter 13, the word hear, H-E-A-R, hear is the central word. In Matthew 13, the word hear is used 19 times. 19 times. So it's important that we hear and that we understand. Also notice the word fruit is used here. The word fruit means success. When does success come if you're out sowing seeds in a garden? Let me give us this, have a little example here. For example, if I'm going to plant strawberry seeds, I, I, I spread strawberry seeds out. When does success come? Success comes when I go take my bucket and pick up a bucket full of what? Strawberries. When the, when the seed has been planted, it has grown, it has produced fruit, and I now have that fruit, that is success. That's success. And so for the word of God, the seed, the word of God to have success, it, bring, it is in the form of salvation. When a man, a woman, a boy or a girl hears the message and believes and turns from their sin and trusts Jesus as their Savior, then they are bearing fruit. They're leaving their old life and embracing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is reflected in, among other places in Galatians 2 and verse number 20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been put to death. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. That's the definition of success. And the life, he says, I now live in the flesh. I live by the grace of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so that's how we see the fruit. So let's look at these four descriptions of four different kinds of hearts based on four different kinds of soil. And the sower goes out to spread the message of the gospel of Christ. And so as the message of the gospel of Christ goes out, the first description of a human heart is this. Some people have a hard heart. You ever known anybody that's hard hearted? Verse number 3, the sower went out to sow. Verse number 4, and he, as he sowed, some of the seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Let me take a moment and say this, that if Jesus tells the parable in the first part of Matthew 13, and in the latter part of Matthew 13, he explains it. Here's what it means. So in verse 4, he says, as the farmer, as the sower sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Verse 19, he explains it this way, when anyone hears, what's our key word? Hear. How many times in Matthew 13? 19 times. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, they have a hard heart. That's why they don't understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Interesting. Here we see the seed is the word of God. Here we see the soil is a hard path. It's, it's pictured as a path. And, and we all know what a path is like. And, and listen, if you're going from here to there, and, and there's not a concrete or a sidewalk to walk on, you and I, we look for a path, don't we? Why? Because there's not grass and weeds and sticks. You can see what's there. And you can walk on something that's hard. And you know that if you have a hard path, you're not going to step in the mud, and it's not going to sink up and mess up your shoes. So we want a path. Paths in themselves are not bad, but when the hardness of a path is a picture of the hardness of your heart, now we've got some issues. Well, let me ask this question. Why are paths hard? You walk on a path sometimes. If you're not careful, some, you know, I've, I've, I've uh, come across folks that they love their yard. And so uh, when they walk from one part of their, their, their porch to, the, to their, their work building or, or out there in the yard, they always go a different direction because they don't want to wear a path in their yard. I see some of you not. Yeah, that's right. You're not supposed to do that. But what is it that makes a path hard? It's simply being trampled by feet or trampled by a wheelbarrow. But when something is trampled and trampled and trampled and trampled, it compacts and it gets hard and it builds up. And if you've got a path somewhere to, to protect your feet, that's a good thing. But, but when people are going from one place to another for an experience, for an opportunity, for a relationship, for a job, for, for any number of different reasons, then that soil gets hard. And that's a good thing. But what about when it's applied to the heart? Why is it that hearts get hardened? Why do human hearts get hardened? I think there's a lot of similarities here. Instead of being trampled on by feet, the human heart gets trampled on by life. 
and by people and by circumstances and experiences and opportunities and disappointments and relationship and sin and guilt and hurt and defense mechanisms. And if we're not careful, we can easily come to understand not only why some people out there have hard hearts, but why we ourselves have hard hearts. Because life happens and our hearts can become hardened. In a spiritual sense, a hardened heart is not a good condition to be in. In the story, Jesus talks about the birds coming and snatching up the seeds. Remember, the seed is the gospel. Someone has shared the gospel to someone with a hard heart, and the birds have come and snatched it away. When the story, verse 19, Jesus said, the evil one, Satan, the devil, he's the one that comes, and listen to what Satan does. He takes advantage of our hardened hearts to snatch away the gospel before it can sink in. I've never been a farmer. The closest I've been to sowing seeds is with my spreader for for grass seed and and fertilizer. That's about the extent of it. But I've seen and heard and and, and things where where farmers, when they're they're out sowing those seeds, oftentimes the birds just flock around and they're diving down. They're trying to get those seeds. Before the seed can sink in, the birds want to get the seed. And the birds are taking advantage of the seed being freshly sown in order to snatch it up so they can have it. And Jesus uses that picture to say the evil one is always looking to take advantage that when the gospel message is sown, when it hits that hard heart, the evil one is there to snatch it up before anything can happen. Notice the results here that we see. The seed, people hear the seed, they hear the gospel, but they don't understand it. They hear it, but they don't understand it. They hear it, and they don't understand it because their heart is hardened for any number of reasons. But the heart is hardened, so it's not there to will it, it's not able to accept the seed, and it's snatched away by the evil one who's always looking to take advantage of our hardened hearts. You can, you can write that down and take it to the bank. The evil one is always looking to take advantage of your hardened heart. That's the, that's the first kind of person. The second kind of person, we would say this. Some people have a shallow heart. Not only a hard heart, but some people have a shallow heart. Listen to the the parable, verses 5 and 6, where he says, The the sower's gone out to to sow seed. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, They withered away. Well, there's the picture. Now, what's the meaning? Verse 20 and 21. As for that which was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word. Now, remember, what's our key word? Hear. How many times in in Matthew 13? 19 times. So this is the one who hears the word, verse 20, and immediately receives it with joy. What a great passage. Hears it and immediately receives. Receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. But endures for a while. And when tribulation. Or persecution arises. On account of the word. Immediately. He falls away. Interesting. Now back to our definition. The seed is the word of God. The soil. The picture of the soil here. Is a shallow soil. With rocks underneath the surface. Now, you can imagine if you're sowing seed and the ground may look just fine on the surface and you may not be aware that in certain spots there's a rock and the rock might be 10 inches below the surface. It might be 5 inches below the surface. It might be half an inch below the surface. But the seed falls and the seed begins to take root and it shoots right up because people sometimes hear the message of the gospel. They get excited about the message of the gospel. They say, I'm embracing the message of the gospel. And they spring right up. And that's, that's about all outward appearances. Everything looks great immediately, right away, the first thing. But what happens is, that's a weak faith. It's a limited understanding. 
It's a decision that's not quite sincere because it, it may be somebody who's hearing but doesn't know the, the complete message of the gospel, doesn't understand the implications of embracing Christ as your Savior. And listen, all you have to do is turn from your sins and believe on Jesus, and by the authority of Scripture, you are saved. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to read the Bible from cover to cover. But, but it's important that you understand that what it means when you become a Christian and a follower of Christ. We can embrace it immediately, but if our heart still has those rocks in it, there's still a shallowness, then, then, then we're not going to last long in the faith. That's what Jesus was saying here. The Son here represents persecution because of the Word. Persecution because of the word. Again, I'm not a farmer, but it makes perfect sense that I do know this much. When, when the sun comes on a garden or on plants of any kind, for plants that have strong, healthy, deep roots, the sun allows growth to take place. The, the, the sun is a, is a help. In fact, the sun is essential for growth to take place in plants. But for plants that have a weak root or a shallow root system, the sun, the same sun that brings life and growth to some plants can bring death to others because they have no roots or shallow roots and they get no moisture and they have no strength and they wither very quickly on the vine. So the sun comes. And notice the sun represents persecution because of the word. What are the results? Well, this person hears with joy. Receive it with joy. And this person expects great things to happen. Now I've, I've, I've professed my faith in Christ. Life is going to be great. Life is going to be easy. I'm not going to have any troubles. I'm not going to have any difficulties. Because I know Jesus as my Savior. That person has a, a shallow understanding of the gospel. A shallow understanding of what it means to be a true follower of Christ. Failing to understand that when you and I know Jesus as our Savior, there will, be, there will be difficulties that come our way. Can I get a witness to that this morning? And notice where the difficulties come from. It's not the regular difficulties of life that we all face. It's, it's not that we get older, that we get sick, or that, that difficult things happen. That happens to everybody. But here the Son represents the persecution that comes to the believer because of the Word. Because you are a professing believer in Christ, you're going to receive persecution by the world. The birds of the devil are circling around. Difficulties and, 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 and things will happen because you are a follower of Christ. There will be those in your family who don't like the fact that you've turned your life over to Christ. There will be those at your workplace. They won't appreciate the fact that you're not doing the things you used to do in your company. There will be people in your, in your friend group, in your circle, your team, in your community, your neighbors, your friends, whoever it might be. There will be those who will not like the fact that you've embraced Jesus as your Savior. And they will let you know it either by their words, their actions, the circumstances. And sometimes it just might cost you something only because you are a believer and a follower of Christ. That is very true in the days of the New Testament. It's very true in the Old Testament, the people that followed after God, especially prophets. They didn't fare too well oftentimes in the Old Testament. If you look at all throughout history, there have been many historical evidences and examples of people that embraced Jesus as their Savior, and they, and they pay for it with their life ultimately. Now, we're immune to a lot of that in the year 2024, but only in America, perhaps. There are places around the world right now that if you profess your faith in Jesus, you can just mark the words of Scripture, and it's going to happen that you will be come against by the government, by your community. You'll be cast out. You'll be thrown out. You'll, your life will be in danger. And so here's, here's, what, here's what the picture is. that somebody who says, yes, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus. But then when those difficulties start coming, that person who has no root, it is not, it is not sunk in yet, it has not, not, not been the life change, they don't have a full understanding of it, they're going to fall away because of the tribulation, because of the persecution, because of God's Word. And with a little bit of root, only a little bit of understanding, this person becomes offended at the difficulty of the gospel. And they say, that's not for me. What little bit of faith began, had begun to develop, they turn and they walk away. They retreat. That's the second kind of a heart that some people have. Some people have a hard heart. Some people have a shallow heart. Thirdly, some people have a worldly heart. 
a worldly heart. Notice the description in verse number 7. Other seeds, remember the sower is throwing seeds. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them or choked out the seeds. What is that talking about? Jesus explains it in verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. Are you tired of hearing me say that the, the, here is the key word in Matthew chapter 30? How many times have I mentioned that it's there? 19 times. So I've still got a few more to get to when I get to 19. But this is a person who, has, who hears the word. Hear. It's important that we hear. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Here's our definitions. The seed is the word of God. The soil is thorns, thorny soil, a worldly heart. And the result, think about this. The the seeds have gone into the thorns. It's not that you have thorn seeds and the seeds that were sown of the gospel. The seeds aren't thrown together and then the thorns choke out the, the, the gospel seeds. No, the thorns are already there. It, it, the picture here is of if, if, a, if the sower or the farmer is going around the edges or, or some place where the thorns have grown up in the field already. And so the seed lands among thorns that are already there. They've already established their roots. They've already grown up. So the seeds are landing in an area where the thorns are already present. It's a reminder of our hearts. Sometimes when, when the word of God comes, it, it, ta- it hits our heart just like they are already. A hard heart, a shallow heart, in this case, a thorny heart. A thorny heart. And so the results are simply this. The thorns are already there. They've already started growing. They're they're farther along in their growth and development than the the seed that has just now been planted. And notice what it says here. That the, the, the thorns, they grow faster, they're higher, they're thicker. And they choke out the new seeds. They choke it out. They choke it out. The gospel was heard, but it was choked out by the heart that was focused on two things. The cares of the world and the pursuit of riches. The cares of the world and the pursuit of riches. These are two things that affect all of us. We all have cares in this world. That's why we have jobs. We all have cares in this world. That's why we go to the doctor. We all have cares in this world. That's why we look after our kids and call and check on our grandkids. Amen? We all have cares. Is there anything wrong with having cares in the world? No. There's nothing wrong with having cares of the world. And also the pursuit of riches. Now, you know, it, it's, we, we, all have, we all need money. Isn't that right, Joyce? We all need money. I need some money. So if you've got some extra, just say, I need some money. We all need money, right? We need money to pay bills, to buy a house, to buy a car, to get our groceries, to put clothes on our back. We need money. And so there, is there anything wrong with being, being mindful of the cares of the world and the need that we have of money in order to provide for ourselves and our family? And listen, the Bible speaks about leaving an inheritance to our children and our children's children by accumulating the things of this world, by being a good steward of God's resources. Those things are fine. So what's the, what's the issue here? The issue here is not that we have cares of the world, not that we have a need to, 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 to work and to, to get money so that we can provide for ourselves. The issue here is being so consumed with the cares of the world and so consumed with obtaining wealth and earning money. We're so consumed with those things, good things, but, but we have an overabundance of concern in those areas that when we hear the gospel message, we say in our hearts or in some form or fashion, I don't have time for that Jesus message. I'm so busy trying to accumulate. I'm so busy trying to take care of myself. I'm so busy trying to provide for my family. I don't have time for this gospel stuff. I don't have, I don't have the mental time. I don't have the, the spiritual time. I'm not, I'm not able to invest myself. Maybe that's a good message for you. I'm just, it's just not a good message for me. I don't have time. Interesting. Interesting. The perspective here. It's a good thing to be concerned about. But when we are overly concerned, it can actually cut out, choke out the message of the gospel. I'm reminded of the words of 1 Timothy 6, 7, where it says, We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. You're not taking anything with you when you go. Amen? I'm also reminded of the words of Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things, they'll be added to you. You trust God. 
You follow God. You pursue the things of God. He's going to make sure that you have what you need. And if there's a situation where you don't have what you need, it could be either you don't need it or God hasn't provided for it or He hasn't provided for it yet. But you just trust God. And you be obedient to what He's called you to do. And He has called you to be mindful of the cares of the world. He has called, called you to go out and provide for your family and to work and to earn. All those things are fine, but when... When, overly, when, they, when they overly take over our concerns, we miss out on the most important thing, which is our relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we get so concerned with taking care of things that we neglect to trust God who's promised to take care of us. And so the needs of, of our lives, the cares of the world, the pursuit of riches, choke out the message of the gospel because we're so earthly-minded that we can't receive the message of the gospel. So some people have a hard heart. Some people have a shallow heart. Some people have a worldly heart. But the fourth example Jesus gave from this story is some people have a receptive heart. There are those who receive the message. Verse number 8, part of the parable. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixty. Some 30. The explanation from verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word. Have I mentioned that the word hear is the most important word here? Jesus is talking about. The word hear is used how many times? You may know 19 times in Matthew 13. All four of these hearts have heard. Have heard. Now what do you do with what you here, notice in verse 23, that as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. Hears the word and understands the word. Hearing the word, it can, it, it, the, the hard-hearted person heard the word, but the, but the hard-hearted uh, situation brought, brought the evil one to snatch it up. The shallow person heard the word, but it never sunk in far enough to take deep root and to cause life. The worldly person heard the word, but the cares of the world choked it out. But the receptive heart heard the word and understood it, received it. It began to, to sink into the soil. It began to, to spread out roots. It began to, to germinate. It, it sprouted, and, and so it began to produce fruit. The person heard it and understands it. When Mark related this story, it says he heard, uh, Mark 4.20 says, the one who hears the word and accepts the word. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus says it this way, the one who hears the word and holds fast to the word. In other words, it's not something that just bounces off when you hear it or that, yeah, today you, you decide you're going to follow Jesus, but tomorrow you turn away. This is a person who hears it and it sinks down and the roots begin to grow and then the person sprouts up. And, and as the sun shines, even the difficult days, the person begins to flourish in their faith because of Jesus Again, Matthew 13, 23. He bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, another 60, and another 30. The seed is the word of God. The soil is a receptive heart. And the result is that they, they hear, they accept, they understand, they hold fast, and it begins to produce fruit. Individual fruit in the life. Remember the, in Galatians 5 it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. These things begin to happen in the person's life. They begin to follow after the things of Christ. Persecution comes because, because your parents or your children or your neighbors or your friends or your co-workers may not like the fact that your life is now different. And you're, you say, whatever, whatever you say against me, I want to tell you about Jesus and I want to let you know, whatever you say, I'm still going to live for Jesus. Whatever you say, I want you to be my friend. I want, to tell, I want you to have what I have. But if you come against me, I just want you to know, I'm still going to follow Jesus. And when somebody has that attitude and takes those steps of growth, and, and, and when they're confronted with persecution, they take that stand of faith, guess what happens to their faith? It begins to grow. And somebody's going to say, I don't know what it is you got, but I want it. I've looked at many people over the years. I've said, I want the kind of faith that person has. I hope somebody can say that about you. I don't know what it is you got, but I want it because it's impacted 
your life. And when they say that, for you to be able to say, well, let me tell you about what Jesus Christ has done in my life. The focus of this parable is to hear the word. As the seed is spread, it's spread by hearing. The gospel is spread by hearing. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Matthew 13, verse 18, Jesus said, Hear then the parable of the sower. Hear the parable of the sower. And again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke each Say, each used slightly different words to, to, to relate what Jesus had said. In Matthew 13 and verse 9, Jesus says it this way, He who has ears, let him hear. In other words, pay attention. If you can hear my voice, Jesus is saying, pay attention. If you hear me, pay attention. Mark says it this way, pay attention to what you hear, to what you hear, the content, the message of the gospel. Luke 8, 18, take care then how you hear. Make sure that when you are hearing... Make sure that you're hearing what, not only what it says, but what it means so that you can understand it, so that you can apply it to your life. Why are we participating in Serve NC? I started the message with this. I'm going to end it with this too. Why are we participating in Serve NC? It's for the same reason that we're meeting today as a church. It's for the same reason that, that, that we have connect groups. Both, both now, uh, for, for those that are going to our next worship service in the gym, they're in connect group now. And after this worship service, we have connect groups for each and every person in this room. Why is it that, that we are participating in servancy? For the same reason that we worship and we have connect groups and we have Wednesday night activities and that we do all the other things that we do so that we can sow seeds and, and reap, a, reap a harvest. Servancy is just one opportunity to throw some seeds out. Now, let me ask you this question. In, in any gathering of Ridgecrest Baptist Church, a worship service or, or the Iwana kids on Wednesday night, whatever we're doing, in anything that we do as a church, what, which of those four types of hearts are represented when we gather? Are there people with hard hearts when we gather? Are there people with shallow hearts when we gather? Are there people with worldly hearts when we gather? Are there people with, with uh, receptive hearts when we gather? All of those. What would happen on a Sunday if I said, okay, let me get your attention before we get started, before Al leads us in our first song, all the hard-hearted people would just sit over here. And all the shallow-hearted people, you sit up front so you can hear clear. All of you that are worldly kind of fill in across the middle section, all three rows. And if you're receptive, I want you to sit at the back because you're going to hear it no matter where you are. Al, they'd all be at the back. Everybody wants a receptive heart. I pray you want a receptive heart. Everybody doesn't have a receptive heart. And every time we gather, there are people in, in a gathering, and I will promise you, I don't know who you are, but I promise you there are people right here in this room, you're hearing, that's our key word, you're hearing my voice, but the word is not going to sink in. It's not going to develop. It's not going to grow. The roots are not going to go deep. Because in your life, perhaps, you're hard-hearted, shallow-hearted, or worldly-hearted. And here's the good news. Jesus can bust up the hard-hearted. Jesus can dig out the rocks of the shallow-hearted. Jesus can take those thorns and ball them up and throw them in the fire. Whatever the condition of your heart and their hearts are, Jesus can overcome. We're going to end with prayer. Prayer for you and for each of us. Prayer for our neighbors who we want to reach with serve NC, but we want to reach, we don't want to wait till August, do we? Why don't we start right now? Who would God bring to your mind that you could have a conversation with? We don't have to have serve NC. We're going to do it. We don't have to have it. Why not start right now? Who is somebody? Who, what neighbor do you have that God could put on your heart that you could give a kind word, ask for a prayer request? I went in a convenience store the other day, and it's one of those moments. I don't just bust up in there, but I'm looking for a moment to speak to somebody about the things of God. And, and the, the guy behind the counter, in the store by himself, I walk in there. I said, hey, man, how can I pray for you today? And he told me uh, some things, and I said, okay, great. So I'm paying my bill. And then he looked at me. He said, and how can I pray for you? I didn't tell him I'm a pastor. I'm kind of incognito. But he said, how can I pray for you? And I told him, well, we just had a great time. And if I had not brought that up, we would have passed like two ships in the night not even knowing whether each one was a believer or not who do you know what door could God open for you to share the wonderful good news 
of Jesus. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to pray for God to open the doors for our neighbors. Would you stand with me as I pray? We thank you, O oh God, that because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that we celebrate next Sunday, we thank you that you break up the hard-hearted, you dig up the stones, and you weed out the thorns so that we might have receptive hearts to hear, understand, hold fast, and live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's not always pleasant to dig up a hard heart or dig out the stones or dig out the weeds. Make us, Lord, to be receptive to the work of your word, the work of your Holy Spirit. Change our lives. Mold us and shape us. The Lord, we might be, each of us, receptive to God for salvation, receptive for growth and development as a believer, receptive for service and ministry and missions in our life. And then, Lord, use us to go out into our community, to our neighbors, wherever they are, knowing that we'll be dealing with a lot of hard-hearted people, a lot of shallow people, a lot of worldly people. But we do it with great confidence because you can take each of those and make them soft, receptive, hearted people to the gospel. We trust it into your care to do your part. Help us be willing to do ours as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our last song, and we conclude our service. Rodney Hicks will be here at the front as always. Be glad to talk with you, pray with you, encourage you any way that he possibly can. We want to be here for you so that together we can connect with our neighbors for the glory of God through Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall Forget that.